My name is Mike, and uh, obviously I'm not Pastor Mac. Pastor Mac is in South Florida today speaking at one of our churches that we're very close with down there. And so he went through the roster, and I guess most people were busy because you got me (laughs) this morning. As many of you guys know, my wife and I were born up in Toronto, Canada. And for Canadians, it's very normal to stay where you grew up. Almost every aunt, uncle, cousin, sibling, grandparent, parent, both sides of our family are all within an hour of each other. And see, when we got married in 08, we had the idea of that's not our hope. Our hope is we want to go on in a little bit more of an adventure. We wanted to get to a place like Austin, Texas. So we were told you had to go through California. (laughs) So in 2012, seven and a half months pregnant with our oldest, we relocated to San Francisco. I went down there on a TN visa. I don't know if any of you guys have come to the US, not being born in the US, but a TN visa, came down as an economist. Not sure how the lawyers figured that out. They didn't see my grades in college. But I came in and it gave me a few years to be associated with that company. So that company sponsored me. I, I didn't have freedom to kind of apply and move around and I had to stick with that company. But again, that was our hope. This was part of our adventure. So we decided that we want to take the next step. We're enjoying it here. We now have two American girls born in California. We're going to go and apply for a green card. So a green card is a permanent resident, basically all rights, but I can't vote. I can move jobs. I can bounce around. I can relocate to Austin. Um, But this green card gave me a lot more flexibility. Again, we're enjoying it. And after five and a half years of holding a green card, you can apply to become an American citizen. So this past summer, my wife and I applied to become American citizens. Not sure how long that process would take, and it was only a few weeks later we got a letter in the mail to say, hey, come down to San Antonio to the immigration office, and you're going to go through an interview, two-hour interview. We're going to go through your background checks, who you are, we're going to check your international travel, and by the way, you're going to have a test. I don't know if any of you guys have gone through this, but they have a potential of 100 questions that they could ask you, civics, geography, Um, you know, stuff around history, wars, presidents, all this. You got to pass. Seven out of ten, they're going to ask you questions to write out sentences and to read those sentences. I'm just happy to say that they didn't ask me to properly pronounce the words about and out. I can still say that as a Canadian. But I passed that test and stand here today as an American citizen. (laughs) Pastor Max has been talking about a few guys and their hopes and their adventures. We've been in this sermon series, Normal is Overrated, looking at four men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Four men that if you saw them, you would not go, hey, those guys are world changers. But these four men, ordinary, lived incredible lives. See, these four men were used by God in messy situations. Pastor Max has been talking a lot about messy situations that we live in today. See, these four men, habits matched their hopes. We're going to dig into Daniel. Daniel in a story we probably all know, either as a kid from Sunday school, maybe seen it on the big screen, but Daniel's messy situation of getting into a lion's den. And so before we do that, if you would... We're going to go to a few verses here to set the stage for that story. So if you have your phone or Bible, we're going to read Daniel 6, 10 to 17. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, your majesty, won't they be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands and it is official law of the Medes and the Persians That cannot be revoked. It's a pretty good king voice there. (laughs) Then they told the king, 
That man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. See, he still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of that predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said again, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. I think it's important for us to go back. Before we get into that messy situation with lions, we need to look at a little bit of Daniel's life, little things that set him up to be prepared to be used and to be able to handle with confidence and trust that situation. See, Daniel was born into a royal family, kind of had all things taken care of, part of the tribe of Judah. See, mom and dad had good jobs. He was in a good school district. All things were great, good community. See, mom and dad, though, wanted to teach him some priorities, wanted to set him up for some of the right hopes. So he taught him about God, taught him about what that relationship should look like, taught him the habits he needed to put into place to build that relationship with God. And as we know, Pastor Mac talked about it over the last few Sundays, the Babylonian Empire came into his community. See, they came down there looking for talent. They wanted to build up what they had back at home. So they looked around and saw Daniel and his three friends and others and said, hey, you guys look like cream of the crop, pretty fit guys, teenagers, strong, good head on your shoulders. We're gonna take you guys back to Babylon. That 1,600-mile trek away from his family, away from his friends to a whole new foreign place. See, it was early on we start to see some of the habits that Daniel had preparing him for the messy situations that were to come. See, right out of the gate, the Babylon said, hey, you know, we've just been traveling with you those 1,600 miles. We know you guys are vegans, keto diet, drink water. But, you know, we over here, we like to have a little more fun. We eat the meat. We drink the wine. We have big feasts. You guys are going to participate with us. You're going to partake like we do. Probably still a teenager, Daniel stood up and said, hey, Sorry, guys, that's just, that's not who we are. That's not what we like to do. And you know what? If you come back in 10 days, give us 10 days. We'll keep doing our healthy diet, and you allow these ones over here to take of the meat and drink of the wine. After 10 days, I think you'll notice the difference. So the leader said, okay. Confident young guy, we'll let you try. They came back after 10 days. And they saw the difference. These guys are still sharp, probably still pretty lean, ready to go. Those that partaked of the meats and had fun in the feast, there was a difference. See, right on an early age, Daniel started to stand out. He wasn't normal. See, his habits were matching his hopes. There's many examples through those first two administrations, those first two kings that he lived and served under of multiple stories where Daniel continued to have a seat at the table. He continued to get the respect of the leaders. He was used. One of the kings had those crazy dreams. Crazy dreams. Wasn't sure what they really meant, but he thought he needed to kill almost everyone. Daniel, too, and his friends. Daniel was able to stand in front of them because he had credibility now, and say, hey, hey, king, before you live out those dreams, can I go pray to my God? Can I maybe get some clarity of what you may be dreaming about and come back to you and, and tell you what I learned? And so he did. 
See, there's two things I want you to take from some of these foundational pieces, and there's many stories but we don't have time today to cover to get into our main story. But one, Daniel stayed disciplined with his habits. His hope was to be close to God, and even after being taken from his family, even after being put into messy situations, he didn't abandon that. He stayed true to who he was and what he believed. He still prayed three times a day. He didn't eat of the meat and the drink. How many teenagers probably would show up after traveling 1,600 miles on their kind of simple diet and go, hey, it looks pretty fun over there. Wouldn't mind trying some of that wine. But he didn't. He started to stand out. He started to be different. He wasn't fickle. He didn't go, oh, it's raining today. Not going to go outside and pray. Not going to church. Going to take one off. He stayed consistent with that. The second area we need to set as a foundation here is he see, or sorry, we see God's favor in Daniel's situation. Whether it was providing interpretation to the king's dreams, king constantly welcoming him into situations, helping them problem solve, helping them guide, be a sounding board. See, God used Daniel because his habits matched his hopes. See, Daniel was sharing God. I got to believe, as a teenager going to Babylon, Daniel wasn't sitting there as a hope to go, hey, I can't wait to go be a leader over there. I can't wait to go be a part of something that none of my family or where I don't actually want to live. See, but God used him in even ways that he didn't want or wasn't prepared for, wasn't part of his hopes. See, this leads us to the core part of our story. It was the third administration. The Babylonian Empire is now vanished, and the Persians have taken over. See, King Darius is now in charge. New boss in town. Daniel's probably going, oh, here we go. Just take me a long time to build up that credibility with the old bosses. Been able to kind of set my program in place. They don't push me and challenge me anymore. They let me live out what I want to what I want to do, I want to pray three times a day. But new boss, we've all dealt with that, right? New boss comes in, oh, going to be new processes. Are they going to bring in their own team? Are they going to allow me still to have a seat at the table? Right, we've experienced that. See, but King Darius came in to run this new empire, hearing about this guy named Daniel. He goes, this guy's special. He stands out. He's not normal. He's faithful. He's strong. He's not easily swayed. I'm going to keep that guy around. So as many new bosses do, they come in and they want to put a new org structure in place. Right? I got to put my own flavor, my own fingerprints on this thing. So we're going to set it up. We're going to have three commissioners. Three commissioners. Daniel, you're going to be one of those commissioners. And underneath those commissioners, there's going to be 120 satraps or governors. And see, everything was working really well with this new program. Daniel and King Darius, they were getting along great. Not just a great working relationship, but a strong personal relationship. They were growing to be close friends. See, Daniel with his peers, the other two commissioners and the 120 governors, they were doing lunch together. They were going for yoga class. They were getting along. Everything was going smoothly. But again, as we can relate to in our own lives, bosses like to switch things up a little. Hey, this is working, but I want to make a few tweaks to this org structure of ours. I really like what Daniel's doing. There's something different about him compared to the others. And so I'm going to reshuffle this thing, and I'm going to make Daniel my second in charge, my chief of staff, my president, whatever you may call it. He's going to run this empire with me. And as we can imagine, that stuff rubs people the wrong way, right? People can be intimidated by one's integrity and one's excellence. We may have experienced that. We may have participated in that. So King Darius sends out the company-wide email and announces the changes. And those two commissioners, those peers of Daniel go, that's not going to work for us. That guy's not even part of us. 
He's a captive. We're going to do something about this. So they sneak off to the coffee shop. And they go, what are we going to do? Let's, let's brainstorm together. Where, where's Daniel's weaknesses? Where's his gaps? What can we pick apart and try to get him in trouble? Not coming up with any clever idea. They go, man, that guy is so, so stable, so disciplined. He prays three... He prays three times a day. That's what it is. We're going to use his habits against him. So they went running back to the king. King Darius, King Darius, guess what? We've got, we've got an idea. We've been thinking about this for a long time. This, this didn't just come up in, you know, since these org changes, but we've been thinking about this for a long time. We want to honor you. We love you so much. You're doing such a great job. We want to pray to you only for 30 days. As most bosses do, maybe a little bit of an ego, go, huh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, I am doing a pretty good job. I like that idea. But no, King, King, so here's the deal. We want this to be so important that if anyone breaks that, if anyone goes against that, we're gonna, we should put into law that they go into the lion's den. We want to make this serious. This, this month's all about you. He goes, man, that sounds pretty good. Wait, what, what about Daniel? I mean, Daniel prays to his own God. Oh, no, we talked to Daniel. Daniel's all good with this. He loves you so much. He can't wait. Can't wait to just pray for you. So the king passes that law. As we read in the verses, Daniel goes back to his room and gets on his knees and prays to God, God, what do I do? This is my habit, is to come to you. I'm being told there's a new law. Those sneaky commissioners, they put that webcam in that room, got it all set up, and they go, got him, got him. Went running back to the king, hey, king, 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 look at this video. Hear the audio. He's praying. It's not to you. It's to his own God. Remember what you said. You put it in the law can't be revoked, cannot be revoked. The king goes, no, no, nah, that is not what I had planned. This is not what I meant. That's my friend. And he sat there all day, probably pulled the lawyers in, trying to look at a loophole in the, in the law, and nothing, nothing could be figured out. So he said to his guards, guards, go get Daniel and bring him back. We gotta take him to the lion's den. As they walk down to that den, guards having Daniel, those two sneaky commissioners following, I'm sure. And the king goes, hey, Daniel, I'm sorry, man. Please, please pray to your God. Please pray that he'll protect you, that he'll rescue you from this situation. And he rolled that stone across that den. See, all night the king couldn't sleep. Sitting there probably at the edge of his bed, just sick to his stomach of what he did. And as that sun was rising that next morning, he's like, I gotta go down to that den. And so he runs down, guards following, those commissioners as well. And he just thought, you know, I'll just double check. Hey, Daniel, Daniel, are you okay in there? Daniel, are you alive? Daniel probably rubbing the sleep out of his eyes. Going, hey, hey, king. Yeah, I'm good. What, Daniel, the, the lions didn't eat you? Well, I mean, king, it took me a little while to get to know them, but, you know, Simba and Mufasa and Scar. You know, Scar's a little grumpy, but he gets around. He comes around. No, they didn't touch me, king. See, I prayed to my God for protection, and he protected me. See, Daniel had faith. His habits created confidence, created trust. Because of that, Daniel used God again. See, and as that stone got moved and Daniel came walking out, the king goes, no, nope, gonna be a new law in town. See, we're gonna pray to Daniel's God. 
There's something special about that. We just all witnessed it. We all just saw it. You two commissioners, you're going to go in there. Roll the stone back. See, in preparing for this, I thought about where do my habits or where have my habits matched my hopes. I mentioned to you guys that born and raised up in Toronto. And so as a kid, I don't know if I had an option, but I was born with ice skates on. And at 2 to 22 years old, you would have seen my habit. I was playing competitive hockey. That was my hope, and that habit matched that every day. You drive by mom and dad's house, that garage was so messed up from me smoking that ball against it. Foot of snow outside after school, didn't matter. We were shoveling that street or the rink in the neighbor's backyard. Didn't matter how cold it was, we'd take a break, go inside, put our hands under warm water, get some feeling back, go back outside. See, I was the first one on the ice, last one off the ice. And for 20 years, I lived out a habit that matched a hope of mine to play competitive hockey. See, I'm very confident with this right now. I'm not sitting here thinking about, like, if I had a golf club in my hand, I'd be sitting here going, okay, feet, shoulder width apart, grip, this, that. See, my habit of golf doesn't match my hope of golf, of being a scratch golfer. But, so, but my habit of hockey, it matched that hope. I'll tell you this as well. Mom and dad let me live out that hope. Every practice, every game, they were there. And about grade five or six, see, I was good enough to go and continue to move up. But dad sat me down and he said, hey, Mike, I love that you love this. And, you know, maybe one day you'll get there, maybe you won't. Ended up being five, nine, 160 pounds. So you can see why I didn't get there. But he said, hey, Mike, that next team, if their commitment is for you to be there on Sundays, just so you know, we choose church first. I'm not pointing a finger right now. I got two competitive athletes at home. I get it. I'm just telling you what my mom and dad did. At 40 years old, I'm very glad that I understood the uh, difference of those priorities and hopes and how those habits need to match. See, Lori and I, about five years ago, six years ago, I had a big hope of being a successful business person. I wanted to run companies. I wanted to scale companies. I wanted to exit companies. And so I was on the road. That, that habit matched that hope. I also had a hope, though, of being a great husband and being a great father. And those habits kind of matched that hope, but they were at a different priority. See, it's hard being a husband and a father from FaceTime from somewhere in another part of the world. So we sat down and said, okay, where do those, what do those priorities look like? What hopes need to be in what order? And do those habits match? Do I still have a desire to be a very successful business person? Sure. But the habit matches the hope and where that sits in my life. I got to think, too, about who do you surround yourself with? Who has similar hopes? Who's living out those hopes with discipline? It can be simple. Hey, I want to be in great shape. You sit, them, sit there and watch people with a bag of chips. They're always going for fast food. You go, probably not going to watch or listen to you when it comes to habits matching hopes. I want to have a great relationship with him. And they're great and disciplined going to the Bible studies, coming to church on Sundays, youth group, whatever it may be. See, surrounding yourself with people that live out those habits, matching those hopes. See, we've had some special guests here over the last few months. Darren Woodson, three-time Super Bowl champ. Candace Cameron Bure. Coach Rodney Terry, UT basketball. We heard a lot about their hopes and their habits. Darren sat on stage here and didn't talk about having the right coach that taught him how to run the 40 and 4.2 and set him up for life. No, he talked about mom, quite emotionally talked about mom and her discipline of going to church, of her discipline of trusting God, praying to God. 
Darren told us at 527 every morning, he goes into his room and prays. That's how he starts his day. He has a habit that matches his hope. See, I gotta think if, what if we had Daniel here as a special guest? What would he tell us about his life, of his journey? What would he challenge us us with? I think he'd tell us, you know, hey, God prepares you and uses you, if you're willing. I think he would say, how many of us expect full-time blessings, but with part-time faithfulness? Maybe even go a little further. Say, does your expectation of God match your commitment to God? Hey, God, I have a big expectation that you help me financially. A lot going on right now. Kids about to go off to college. That's not cheap. Interest rates are really high. Markets are a little shaky. Got a lot in this budget. Got a big expectation for you to help me out with this one. But you don't tithe. See, your commitment to God needs to match your expectation of God. Full-time blessings with part-time faithfulness isn't going to work. I think Daniel would be pretty bold and aggressive with us because look what he had to live through. Look at the messy situations he got put into. Look at the things that he didn't necessarily want to sign up for. But let's look back and go, man, that was a pretty special life you lived. I think you'd tell us, hey, you be faithful You'll be prepared for those messy situations. So who here needs to take a look at their hopes? They may be simple hopes, they may be big hopes. I'll tell you, she's sitting right down here, one of my two. We talk about this all the time. I want you to dream big. I want you to shoot for the stars. I'll be your biggest fan and supporter along it. But your habits better match that. Don't tell me you want to be the next Michael Phelps or Alex Morgan, but then you do kind of nothing about it. That's fine. You don't want to be. I'm not going to push you. But you want to? What do you think you're going to have to do almost every single day? You're going to have to live that out. I may get in trouble afterwards for saying this. <laughs> with her sitting in the front row. Who here is going to be more disciplined with their habits? It's not easy. It's not easy. Hey, I want to start working out. It's not easy to start to do that every single day. We know that. We start to get into reputation. You start to be more constant with it. It comes. We need to prioritize our hopes. Our habits need to match our hopes. So if your hope is to have a relationship with him, maybe it's a brand new thing that you haven't considered till this morning. Maybe you do have a relationship with him and it's lukewarm. It's mediocre. You're here every once in a while. You maybe pray once in a while. Maybe you have a great and strong relationship with him. It's in a great place. There are many different habits that need to be considered in that relationship. There is a habit, though, that I think is a great place to start. We probably all started there as a kid if you were growing up in the church or grew up with parents that lived this out, and it was with prayer. It's the habit of prayer. See, Jesus taught the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. He taught them how to get that habit started. So if you would, I'd ask that you bow your heads with me right now. And just take a moment for us to come to him, to 
come to him and say, God, I need you to help me look at my hopes. I need you to help me prioritize those hopes. I need you to help me with my habits. See, I want to be more disciplined. I want to live out those hopes a lot better than I have been. Or I want to add to those. I've got to find the room to be more disciplined. Just take a moment here and bring that to him. And we're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. Oh. Uh-huh.